The Juvenile Law Center's Leadership Prize uh, is awarded to outstanding advocates working to advance the rights and well-being of youth in the child welfare and juvenile justice systems. Juvenile Law Center has been richly recognized and awarded for its accomplishments and its leadership over the past 40 years. Just as these efforts to advance the field will continue, though, the innovations should continue to be recognized and noted and celebrated. As a result, it gives me great pleasure to be able to announce tonight the establishment of the Juvenile Law Center Leadership Prize. Every prize needs an inaugural winner. And so the inaugural winner of the Juvenile Law Center Leadership Prize for 2015 is Bob Schwartz. I mentioned uh, my admiration for Christopher Wren, uh, the architect, because St. Paul's Cathedral is one of my favorite buildings in the world. Uh, and there was a story that uh, Wren, during the course of the building of the cathedral, came upon one of the craftsmen and said, what do you do, sir? And he said, I'm a stonemason, Mr. Wren. And the architect went on and asked the next guy he saw, who was also a stonemason, what do you do? And he said, sir, I am building a cathedral. So many of us in our profession are asked, you know, what do, what do we do? And we say, well, we're lawyers for children. But that's not really the story. We're building a better world for them. You and me, the folks at Juvenile Law Center, all of our co colleagues, our partners, our funders, uh, that's what we're building together. All of you are part of this movement. We all care about children. We all care about young people. And that we know that we could do so much harm, and we have done so much harm, by incarcerating our young people. I'm happy to say that we've been able to make significant changes uh, in international standards on child soldiers, on child domestic workers, and on children working with uh, mercury in gold mines. And I look forward to continuing to work with all of you to ensure every child the prize of a loving, safe, permanent family. You know, we're all getting started. You know, we've, you know, I come, I stand on the, on the, the shoulders of giants, and there's, there are many, but I also know many people like me that are young and up and coming that are going to do much greater things, and, and I'm proud, and I'm, and I'm humbled, and I'm honored, and I'm grateful. I believe that Americans should be informed that our vision of justice is skewed, manipulated by racism, classism, and stubbornness that keeps outdated policy in place. Juvenile Law Center, thank you so much for everything that you stand for. I appreciate you. I also want to thank my family, uh, Stonely Foundation, who ha helped me when I did finish the Human Rights Watch report, which was amazing based on 500 interviews of children that were raised on registries. Our strongest messengers are people who are formerly incarcerated men and women and victims of violent crime. We all have the obligation to stop, to listen, and to elevate and lift up our young people and to celebrate their hope and their vision and to let them lead us to a better world for every single young person who's in foster care. We can get there. There is an unprecedented opportunity to change our country's approach to child welfare, to create one that is far more prevention-oriented, racially just, and centered on the needs of children and families. We contributed to the idea that science is critical in legal decisions dealing with culpability. Um, we made the courts aware of the fact that you don't just use forensic psychiatrists and psych or psychologists, you have to consult with the, the world of the psychiatrists and psychologists who know how these things affect kids. I learned many critical lessons in my first case. Children and families suffer great harm in systems that value convenience over compassion. One person paying attention can disrupt giant bureaucracies. When you don't know what to do, make up a motion and set it for emergency hearing. And when you visit your nine-year-old client in the hospital, bring a cherry Coke. Good evening, and welcome to Juvenile Law Center's sixth annual Leadership Prize celebration. 
We are so glad that you can be with us tonight to gather together to celebrate our recipients and the work of Juvenile Law Center and feel inspired in these difficult and often painful times to continue to move together with our work on behalf of youth in the child welfare and justice systems. As I said, these are challenging and often painful times. We recently um, all experienced the verdict in the Chauvin case the same day, the killing of Micaiah Bryant, a teenager in foster care in Columbus, and later that same week, the Jones decision by the Supreme Court. Two weeks from now, we'll honor the first year anniversary of the death of George Floyd. And on it goes amidst the concurrent pandemics of racism and COVID-19 and also the mass shootings across our country. But it is so important that we together continue to feel inspired, to continue to feel the power of leaders among us who are paving a path, as we describe with our leadership prize, beacons of light um, to help transform the child welfare and justice systems. Tonight, we celebrate the incredible work of Sixto Cancel, Chris Henning, and the Kansas City Star for their six-part series written by Eric Adler, Laura Bauer, and Judy Thomas. We hope that you will go to our website and join uh, the communications from Juvenile Law Center if you haven't already done so, that you will follow us on uh, all forms of social media, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn. Continue to be connected with us after tonight. It's important for all of us. During tonight's event, you can use the chat feature to give shout outs to the winners, um, shout outs for the work of Juvenile Law Center, shout outs to each other, whatever moves you. And we are trying to raise $25,000 tonight. So please help us. You can text at leader, you can text, I'm sorry, 2021 prize to 44321. That'll be scrolling along the bottom of the screen intermittently tonight. That's 2021 prize to 44321 to add your contributions to that effort to raise $25,000 tonight. So sit back, take a break, enjoy this time together. Let's celebrate Sixto and Chris and the journalists at the Kansas City Star. And we're gonna kick off the evening. I'm gonna turn it over to the chair of our board of directors, Stephen Labaton. Stephen? Thank you, Sue. On behalf of the Board of Directors of Juvenile Law Center, I am delighted to welcome and thank you all for joining us tonight as we celebrate the extraordinary work of Sixtu and Chris, as well as Eric, Laura, and Judy from the Kansas City Star. I want to thank the members of our selection committee and the many volunteers who agreed to participate in tonight's presentation to help us honor our winners this year. And I also want to take this moment to thank all our new and longtime supporters of Juvenile Law Center, who not only gave this past year as the pandemic outbreak took hold and had all of us anxious and uncertain about what was gonna happen next, but who continued to support and fund Juvenile Law Center's work throughout the year. This was essential for helping us navigate the exceptionally hard circumstances the pandemic posed to our kids in the juvenile justice and child welfare systems. It also provided vital resources for our incredibly devoted and fiercely hardworking staff. And it has continued to help sustain and build confidence in our ongoing fight for the rights and well being of kids. So, thank you again for being here tonight as we take this moment now to celebrate leadership and to honor exceptional work advancing the rights of children during these particularly challenging times. Hi, I'm Damon Hewitt, Acting President of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law and Chair of this year's Juvenile Law Center Leadership Prize Committee. I'd like to thank my fellow committee members, Curry Cook, Susan Jen Davis, Kathy Maffa, Anthony Simpson, and Shannon Wilbur for their incredible service and the great work and all of the fun that we had in selecting this year's honorees. Recipients of the Juvenile Law Center Leadership Prize are leading lights in the field. I like to think they're not just the best of the field, but frankly, they're the best of us. 
They show us what this country can do when we put the interests of young people first. Of course, Leadership Prize recipients must demonstrate some significant qualities that we all recognize. A lifetime of work on behalf of youth, landmark achievements in the field of children's rights, or exceptional efforts to shine a light on what's happening with children and young people in this country today. Their work stands out not just above the rest of the amazing pool, amazingly diverse pool that we had this year, but it stands out because it shows us what's possible in this country. It shows us what we can do when we all put our minds towards what's in the best interest of young people. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We've been following their work. I hope you follow the honorees work as well. Good evening. My name is Christina Sorensen, and I am a Soros Justice Fellow at Juvenile Law Center. It's my absolute pleasure tonight to present the Kansas City Star, the 2021 Leadership Prize, in honor of the courageous reporting by Eric Adler, Laura Bauer, and Judy Thomas in the six-part series, Throw Away Kids. Independent and investigative reporting has long served as a mechanism against oppression and injustice. However, news media coverage can often be episodic in nature, providing only the occasional or intermittent exposure of an instance, quickly seeking to blame a bad actor or factor without examining the larger interlocking patterns that amplify and perpetuate harm. Throwaway Kids does more. They examine the larger pattern without losing sight of each individual and each individual experience. My gratitude to them is personal. Within the stories they shared were echoes of my own experience in foster care and that of my sister. Eric, Laura, and Judy have done something truly powerful with their reporting. They help folks tell their own stories. They bridged worlds, hearts, and minds, and the change they have inspired has just begun. It's my honor to present the Kansas City Star with this year's Leadership Prize. come to you today from Kansas. Judy and I are in our home offices and Eric is in Missouri in our office in downtown Kansas City. And first off, we just want to congratulate Kristen and Sixto and what an honor it is to be honorees with you. And I, in the last year, I had the privilege of being on a panel with Sixto. So a great guy and loved learning from his story. So Overall, though, we just want to tell Juvenile Law Center, thank you so much um, for including us this year in your conference as award winners. We just, it, it's a great honor for us. And you do this work, you don't know how it registers with people. You don't know, will it make an impact? Um, will people read it? And this today is just affirmation to us that this story is making a difference. I think it continues to, and it's really in part from the young people who shared their stories with us. And that was, we were just so, um, you know, just wanted to tell their stories and be as honest to them as we could. Always in the back of our mind was what long-term impact does being raised by the state have on these kids? And there was a seed that was planted with us many years ago um, by a well-known, um, beloved advocate here in the Kansas City area, Sister Berta Saylor. And she is one of two co-founders of a um, daycare center for low-income children. She was busy that day, very frantic, trying to find a place for a young man to stay. She was just so adamant that he could not go into state care. And her words never left us. She said, Foster care is just a breeding ground for prison. The three of us worked about a year on this project and Judy is gonna kind of explain to you how we went about to measure, you know, do kids raised by the state too often 
end up in prison. Judy? <laughs> Hi, first off, uh, I also wanna thank the Juvenile Law Center for this wonderful recognition. When we decided to try and survey inmates across the country to find out how many had once been in foster care, we didn't know what to expect. We contacted corrections departments in every state, and in the end, 12 states representing every region of the country agreed to work with us. Uh, we got back nearly 6,000 responses and found that one fourth of those inmates said they had spent time in foster care. Many of the inmates wrote notes on the backs of their surveys. They told us that, that aging out of foster care with few skills or support changed their lives forever. And they said that made their transition to crime easy. One young man wrote on the back of his survey that he was bounced to 80 foster homes from ages three to 14. He told us, I was thrown out into the world with nothing at 18 and was homeless. So I did what I had to do to provide for myself and make do ended up with six felony charges at 18 years old. Over several months, we visited inmates in Kansas, Missouri, and Texas, including one man on death row, all who grew up in foster care. All of them described the trauma of being removed from their homes. Michelle Voorhees, an inmate in Kansas, told us, every single move is a traumatic experience, and the more you get moved around, the more trauma you endure. Having goals isn't important to you. You are concerned with where are you gonna sleep tonight, are you gonna be safe? And Gerald Marshall, who's facing execution in Texas, told us that, quote, the state that neglected me as a kid is the same state that wants to kill me. He said, while he doesn't blame foster care for his incarceration, growing up in an environment that lacked trust and compassion put him on a path to destruction for myself and others. We also found that multiple placements can have long-term effects on a child's brain. And Eric Adler is going to tell us about that. Yeah, again, also, I'd like to thank uh, thank you all for this this honor and, and for Laura and Judy for actually bringing me in on this story. And I'm glad that Judy mentioned some of the people in this series. Listen, there's no journalism without sources. And at the heart of this piece are the people that we've written about, the former foster kids uh, who have grown up in the situations that Laura and Judy have talked about. Uh, and I want to mention a couple of my own. So. I was brought in to, as a former science editor here to, to look at whether or not what goes on in foster children um, is sort of just deeper than the moment and the experience and, and, and you know, does this sort of weed itself into the biology uh, of all of us or anyone who's going through these, these circumstances. And it seems sort of obvious you would think that how can this not, how can those experiences not affect the brain development of children, right? It, it seems just uh, uh, patently absurd that it wouldn't. And I think you all know, as, as we all know, that, you know, the more uh, ACEs, um, uh, you know, adverse childhood experiences that, uh, that young people have, the worse the turnout uh, as they get older. And what science is finding now, however, and is that that actually is being embedded in brain chemistry, that those traumas that placement after placement after placement for kids are part of those traumas. Thankfully, I think with biology at hand, we're also seeing that there may be some ways to improve these systems. If we start looking at all of this in a holistic kind of way, the way that Judy and Laura are talking about, um, there are programs out there that I think are working. And I think we, you know, we bring up some of those and there's the kinds of things that you all support. So um, again, I, I think we've, you know, hopefully brought a light, enlightened people about what is happening nationally, what's happening with the kids around us. And um, I hope we, you know, brought something decent to the conversation. We could go on and on. This is really near and dear to all three of us. So thank you again. And it really is an honor. Congratulations, Kansas City Star, on this truly well-deserved honor. You use such a creative lens to bring national attention to the systemic failings of the child welfare system. You really brought the issue to life in such a creative way. Also, congratulations to Kristen Henning at Sixto Cancel. Such a powerhouse of a lineup, all three of you. Congratulations to all. Good evening, Juvenile Law Center. I'm Jennifer Rodriguez, the Executive Director of the Youth Law Center a 2019 Leadership Prize recipient and someone who's deeply grateful for the work Juvenile Law Center does to protect the humanity and childhoods, children and youth. As a lawyer, I admire Juvenile Law Center's brilliant and tireless advocacy. 
As someone who grew up in these systems, I appreciate Juvenile Law Center's commitment to supporting the leadership of those who are most impacted. That brings me to the incredible leader I have the honor of introducing tonight, Sixto Canso, founder and CEO of Think of Us. Sixto's leadership exemplifies exceptional efforts to not just shine a light on the most important issues affecting youth in foster care today, but also to transform the field so that every youth is equipped with their own spotlight to highlight the issues that are most important to them. Sixto's work seeks to provide youth access to the power they must have to advocate and to thrive, and to also prove to child welfare systems that it's just impossible to do the job of caring for children well without involving those children, not as clients, but as stakeholders whose future is on the line. In a field where youth are rarely included in decisions about their own lives, empowered to make their own choices, or allowed meaningful participation in practice and policy change, Sixto's vision, it's disruptive in the best way. Sixto's advocacy is focused on transforming foster care systems to share power with youth by utilizing technology that centers each youth's individual experience and needs and enables immediate system responses. Rather than relying on a few youth representatives to speak up for the needs of a hugely diverse peer group, Sixto's advocacy works to ensure every youth in foster care as a mechanism to speak for themselves to the systems that are responsible for them. In national policy work, Sixto lives these values too. He's committed to sharing power and creating spaces for leadership and participation of all others with lived experiences. Sixto is also vigilant in elevating the experiences of youth who others often forget or ignore, such as Black, Brown, and Indigenous youth, LGBTQ youth, and youth who are institutionalized in congregate care and juvenile justice. Finally, Sixto is unafraid to challenge the processes that are disconnected from urgency of youth's needs. For example, I've witnessed Sixto push reluctant funders and advocates to move to a firm commitment to end the use of congregate care rather than sanctionalizing institutionalization for youth that were just too difficult for them. In Sixto's work to provide pandemic direct cash aid directly to hundreds of youth across the country, Sixto chose to reject the system's typical distrust of youth by making his grant subject to no difficult screening or any conditions at all. If youth said they needed cash, that was enough. Sixto's trust in youth being the experts in their needs was revolutionary. Sixto is a clear example of a truth. Those with lived experience do not just bring the wisdom and passion of their experiences, but they also bring an urgent commitment to creativity, to innovation, and to finding new approaches that allow systems to meet their promise to children and youth. Sixto, thank you for sharing your curiosity, your sharp brain, your open heart, your entrepreneurial spirit, your go-getter work ethic, your sense of humor, and your willingness to tackle the hardest problems with all of us. We celebrate you tonight as a leader who will never stop innovating and executing until youth have the childhoods, relationships, and opportunities they deserve. Thank you so much for being that leader, and thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Jennifer. It is such an honor to be introduced by you. I really appreciate you, the results, the expertise that you and your organization have had and the contribution that your organization ha has had, especially during this pandemic. I also just wanna thank everyone who showed up here to support the Juvenile Law Center. And I just wanna share a quick story with you. When I was a young boy, um, at 14 in particular, I used to walk to the bus stop with this big old Afro blue polo shirt and khaki pants and I would listen to my mp3 player and I was I was walking and listening to my mp3 player I would play my gospel music and it was because it was one of the things that kept me while I was navigating a very abusive situation and what I would pray is that Lord let me be of service and if I am able to live past 18 that I would dedicate my life to being able to ensure that those who were in foster care didn't experience the same experiences I was having. 
when I think about this particular system and how it is every day failing young people and families, there is no question on what to do. We have to reform, not just reform the system, but to push for the ultimate transformation so that every young person, every caregiver, every single family, bio family, are able to go ahead and have access to that same dream that we have promoted, this American dream, the idea that every human being can become what they want in this country. And as we know, that's just not true right now. And so, I am humbled to receive such an award because it is a representation that we're somewhere on the right path. Just a little tiny confirmation that we might just be doing a little bit of chipping at this big old problem. But I want to take a step back and not center us so much and say that I also want to dedicate this award to the many young people and to the advocates who during the last year have come together in what I would say is the most unprecedented way of coming together. And even when we don't agree, we have always created a better product because of each of our contribution. Right now is a time where I believe we can transform child welfare between the technology push, the new funding, the centering of lived experience in a way that it has never been centered before the training that young people are getting in a way that they have not been trained before. These are the raw ingredients that I believe that we are at just the beginning of a new wave of a new movement where we are going to see a lot more people with lived experience being at the center of solutions, concrete solutions that have evidence behind them. And so what I'm excited about today is the fact that we have a huge opportunity and it begins now. It begins with all of the momentum and the inertia and what needs to be transformed, allowing it to happen now. So I want to thank the Juvenile Law Center, yes, for the recognition of our work, but most importantly, I want to thank every single lived experienced young person who has worked this pandemic, who has showed up for their brothers and sisters in the system. I want to thank the advocate who have worked tirelessly to push bills on the state, local, and federal level. I also want to thank my board who has allowed us to and supported us in a way that allows us to be flexible, um, to be nimble and to kind of move left, right and really figuring out how we support jurisdictions and co-design with young people. I want to thank our funders who have just not only been an investment into Think of Us, but who have lent staff, who have answered the late night calls, who have connected us with their other grantees to figure out how might we hack this problem. Um, I wanna thank my team because Lord knows uh, that we run at a thousand miles per hour, but they're relentless about serving our young people, designing towards making a better future um, with young people. And so thank you to everyone Congratulations to the other honorees. Thank you to all of you who have shown up. I am truly, truly, truly grateful and truly humbled by this award. Thank you. Congratulations to Sixto for being named one of the Juvenile Law Center's Leadership Prize winners. Sixto, you do so much for everyone day in and day out, and you are so deserving of this award. Congratulations. Congratulations, Sixto. You are an innovative strategic mobilizer who has captured the attention of giants and moved mountains of resources for young people. Thank you for your inspirational leadership and your partnership. Congratulations. Hey, Sixto, congratulations. Uh, you are most deserving of this award and so many awards beyond. Thank you for every day that you wake up and you keep dreaming. Thank you for every day that you wake up and you keep pushing. Thank you for the impact you've made on my life and on so many other lives. Thank you for being true to exactly who you are and for leading in the way that feels most true to you. You are an inspiration. You are a model. You are beautiful. You are um, everything, bro. And I'm so glad that you're my family. I'm so glad that we're connected. You are exactly in everything we need. And I love that you continue to pour into yourself and pour into others. 
So congrats, um, I'm with you, I'm celebrating with you, I love you, I'm proud of you, congratulations. Six Doe, congratulations on such a prestige award for such an exceptional person. What you are doing is not only hard work, but it is also heart work. You are changing the way that child welfare systems experience, see, and interact with technology and changing and improving the lives of every young person as you go. I thank you for all that you are, for all that you do. You are the person that breathes life into what at times can seem to be very exhausting work. Today, we thank you for your advocacy, for your justice, for your genius, for your love, for your commitment, for your passion, and for all that you are. Never change that. We love you so much, and I hope that you bask and enjoy this moment. You deserve it. Sixto, I'm just so delighted to join uh, with your family and friends in congratulating you on receiving the Juvenile Law Center Leadership Prize. It's certainly a testament to your longstanding commitment to some of the most vulnerable people in our society, uh, to people who so often haven't had uh, an advocate or a champion and thankfully do in you. I have uh, admired you for many years. I have learned from you for uh, just as many years. And I am so uh, proud to know you and to call you my friend. And I just have deep admiration for, uh, for your work um, with Think of Us and for how you've gone about your work and your advocacy. Uh, Think of Us has empowered many, many hundreds of young people in the foster care system to have agency over their lives, to be able to lead safer, healthier lives. And uh, we need more people to be able to access the service of uh, Think of Us. And we need everyone uh, to really know how special you are, um, how lucky we are to kind of have you uh, in this work, leading this work, and certainly I'm so thankful that you are receiving this more than well-deserved honor. So just congratulations again, my friend. Good evening and welcome. My name is Katrina Goodjoint and I am a staff attorney at Juvenile Law Center. It is an honor and I'm so thrilled to present this award to Professor Chris Henning. I first met Chris when I was a 1L at Georgetown University Law Center. She hosted a dinner for the Black Law Students Association at her home and made us all feel welcome in this new environment. I later had the privilege of working as Chris's research assistant, which allowed me to learn so much from her about child-centered advocacy and helped kickstart my career in this field. As director of the Juvenile Justice Clinic at Georgetown, Chris continues to mentor and support law students who represent young people accused of delinquency in DC Superior Court. Amanda Powell of the National Juvenile Defender Center said this about Chris in support of her nomination. Chris has been a superstar, a role model, and a champion of juvenile defense and racial justice for as long as I can remember. Her influence on me, on juvenile defenders across the country, and through us on our clients cannot be overstated. Chris has conducted racial bias trainings for state actors around the country, including law enforcement, and has written extensively on the intersection of race, adolescence, and policing. Her writings on the reasonable black child standard, for example, have forced courts and advocates around the country to re-examine the systems they work in. Christina Kersey, a defender in New Jersey, said this in support of Chris's nomination. Chris's writing on the reasonable black child standard changed the way we practice law, not only because her critical legal argument is the basis of many of our arguments, but also because it encapsulates exactly why many of us wanted to be youth defenders in the first place. Chris's passion and commitment to this work and her ability to highlight the importance of understanding racial bias and adolescent development are unmatched by anyone else in this field. Chris, thank you so much for your vision, your passion, your dedication to improving the state of juvenile justice, and your leadership in advocating for Black and Brown young people. Please join me in congratulating Chris Henning on receiving the 2021 Leadership Prize.
I am truly honored to receive this award from the Juvenile Law Center, an organization that I have admired since I was a law student many years ago. Moments like this really give us an opportunity to think about why we advocate for children. And I can't help but think of all of the black and brown children who have been impacted by policing in America. And I am especially reminded of my client who I will call Kevin for the moment. I will never forget uh, the day that Kevin called our office and asked if there was a warrant for his arrest. And we were very surprised by the question because we had just seen him in court the day before and there was no warrant. But Kevin kept saying, the police are out front waiting for me. And we could hear his mother saying, no one is looking for you. You're just being paranoid. Um, and people who don't live in Kevin's neighborhood might be thinking, well, if he wasn't doing anything wrong, then there would be no reason for him to believe the police were looking for him. But most of us can't imagine seeing the police every day and being stopped and questioned um, by the police multiple times a week, whether we've done anything wrong or not. But Kevin lives in a neighborhood where police are present all hours of the day and night on routine patrol and answering 911 calls about Black kids just being kids. So when Kevin called us, his mom thought he was being paranoid but I thought he was traumatized and that his fear wasn't irrational at all. And I also kept thinking about how the law doesn't account for Kevin's reality, how our criminal laws don't account for what it's like to be a Black or a Brown child growing up watching other black and brown children choked and body slammed and pepper sprayed and tased and even shot like Nakia Bryan and Adam Toledo. And I think about how the rest of us take our freedoms and liberties for granted. We believe in a constitution that protects us from physical harm and forced interrogations and that allows us to be free from police intrusions unless the police have a legitimate reason to believe we are committing a crime. So I I advocate to make sure children of all races have the legal rights and protections we say we are committed to in this country. But I don't do any of that work alone. I am eternally grateful for the opportunity to start my career as a defender in the Georgetown Prettyman program and to have spent several years at the DC Public Defender Service learning from some of the best defenders in the country. And I am equally grateful to be a part of a larger community of youth defenders who have been fighting for the rights of children every day. And so I thank Patty Puritz for being the original fire that brought that community together. And I am especially grateful for my dear friend, Marianne Scali, for continuing to grow that community at the National Juvenile Defender Center and for her persistent laser focus on racial justice. Almost every racial justice project we have launched at the Juvenile Justice Initiative at Georgetown has been in partnership with NJDC, our Racial Justice Toolkit, and our Ambassadors for Racial Justice Program, among others. So thank you for being a partner in that work. And thank you to all of my Youth Defender friends, Christina Kersey, Amanda Powell, Debbie St. Jean, Tim Curry, to my colleagues at Georgetown, Wally Malenik, Eduardo Ferrer, Reba but Omar, Patricia, Aisha, Jen, and our wonderful Dean, Bill Trainer, for supporting this work. But on this day, I am especially honored to have an opportunity to thank my friends and mentors at the Juvenile Law Center. Thank you to Sue for leading the organization, but special thanks to Marsha Levick and Bob Schwartz, who have taught us how to litigate critical constitutional questions in a way that accounts for adolescent development. And thank you to Marsha for pushing race and the reasonable black child in new directions. As we move forward, I think there is no more important work than our work to eliminate racial inequities in the juvenile and criminal legal system and our work to get the world to remember that black 
and brown children are children too. And as we do that, I can't think of a better group of folks to receive an award <clears throat> alongside of than Sexto Cancel and the Kansas City Star. So congratulations to the both of you and thank you to the Juvenile Law Center. I first met Chris Henning more than a decade ago across a clinic hallway at Georgetown Law and I wanted to be the lawyer that she was. Former clients, former students, and this former research assistant would hang around in the juvenile justice clinic office just to hear her advice on life, on work, on how to make the impact in the world that we always wanted to make. She never stops fighting for the things and the people that matter to her, never stops putting in those hours in the library, in class, in court, across the country, to fight for the rights of kids a little bit at a time. I never understood the phrase, it only takes one person, until I met Chris Henning. Chris, not only have you fought tirelessly for the rights of kids in the juvenile justice system, you've inspired a generation of advocates after you to do the same. I'm so lucky to count myself among them. Congratulations for being a 2021 Juvenile Law Center Leadership Prize winner. I can't think of anyone who deserves it more. Chris, I'm so proud of you. I'm so happy for you and I love, love, love you. Congratulations. I am so excited to have the opportunity to celebrate Chris Henning today. As one of our recent participants in a training said, Chris Henning is a national treasure to the youth defender community. Thank you, Chris, for everything you've done to transform the legal system's response to young people and to establish racial justice. We love you. Good evening. Huge congratulations to our winners tonight, Sixto, Eric, Lauren, Judy, and Chris. Sixto, thank you for your endlessly innovative uses of technology to expand services to older youth in foster care and for your commitment to amplify their voices everywhere and anywhere. Eric, Laura, and Judy, thank you for bringing your excellent investigative skills as journalists to write the critically acclaimed feature, Exposing the Dark Side of America's Foster Care System. And Chris, my friend, my colleague, my advisor, Thank you for bringing your A-game to the work of fighting for our kids, especially kids of color, every day, 24-7. You are a defender's defender, the best of the best, an inspiration and a guiding light that not only shows us the way, you build it for us. The last 14 months have brought unspeakable loss, pain, and grief. The pandemic merged with racial strife and once again has catapulted us toward a racial reckoning. From this darkness, heroes have emerged in every sector of our lives. Tonight, we have taken this moment to step outside our grief, to celebrate our own brilliant Juvenile Law Center Leadership Prize winners, albeit over Facebook, una unable to come together physically once again to celebrate their achievements. But we honor them, we applaud them, we allow ourselves to smile at their accomplishments, and we thank them for soldiering on, even in these darkest of times. We raise a glass virtually to each of you, knowing we will continue to see you in the fight every day going forward. And we hope to see all of you in person next year. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Back to you, Sue. Thank you so much, Marsha. And thanks to everyone who was so inspiring this evening. I felt like I really needed tonight um, just to have sort of some uplifting moments to remember why we are in this work, who the wonderful partners are that we are in this work with. So congratulations and thank you for your remarks to Sixto, Chris, and the, the amazing writers from the Kansas City Star. And thank you to each of the people, both from our office as well as Jennifer, um, who introduced uh, and, and just set up, help us set up the evening in the way we hoped it would flow. I said this last year when we were two months into the pandemic, and I'll say this again this year, I really hope that we can all be together soon. Uh, but until then, this, this helped feed me, and I hope all of you to really inspire you to continue to follow the work of Juvenile Law Center. If you're not signed up to receive our communications, please go to jlc.org and do that. You can make a donation anytime at jlc.org. Please follow us and amplify our messages on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, any platforms that you use. Please follow us, like us, 
amplify our messages um, to your networks. And finally, tonight, one last pitch. We're trying to raise $25,000 and we're really close. Maybe we've even exceeded it since I last checked in. But please uh, text 2021 prize to 44321. 2021 prize to 44321. But anytime you can go to jlc.org to follow our, our work that's you know highlighted on the website, to sign up for our communications or to sign up to do night to donate. Thanks so much for being with us. Stay well and see you hopefully in person next year. Congratulations. from the Annie E. Casey Foundation. I'm so excited to be able to wish Sixto a huge congratulations on this great honor. I can't think of anyone more deserving of an award targeted to someone who's fighting for the rights and well-being of young people who have experienced foster care. Sixto is an incredible warrior who's been doing this for so long and his personal journey as a Jim Casey Initiative Young Fellow for so many years and now as a leader of his own incredible organization, Think of Us. He inspires so many, and I'm proud and so thrilled to be able to work alongside him. Congratulations, Sixto, on your very well-deserved award from Juvenile Law Center. You embody what it means to truly be a leader in child welfare, bringing your lived experience to the table every single day and honoring uh, the voices of young people that are currently going through the system and making sure that that is included when we're talking about what it means to reimagine the system. I am so incredibly proud of you. Congratulations. Sixto, congratulations. Another award and recognition, but we know for you, it's not about the awards. It's about creating better futures for young people that deserve it so much. So here's to you. Thank you for inspiring all of us to think of us and take action to create better futures for young people. Congratulations, Sixto. So proud of you and inspired by you and grateful for your leadership. The world is so much better for it. Sixto, Mary Bissell here. I wanna send you all my love and congratulations on a very well-deserved honor. I can't think of enough great things to say about you, so I'm just gonna quote you my favorite poem from Shel Silverstein. Listen to the mustn'ts. Listen to the mustn'ts, listen to the don'ts, listen to the shouldn'ts and the couldn'ts and the won'ts. Listen to the mustn'ts, then listen close to me. Anything can happen, anything can be. I can't think of anybody else who embodies that go-getter, amazing spirit more than you. Congratulations. <laughs>